Well, good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you out there. I want to welcome you, welcome you to our online worship this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad that you can be here. And friends, I'm so happy that it is the Sabbath once more. I don't know about you, but you know, whenever it's the Sabbath, I am so happy. Why? Because I can rest. You know, this is the one day that I can, you know, not be stressed, not uh, think about work, not you know, think about the things that I usually think about during the week. I can just rest, I can relax, you know, I can spend time with God, I can, you know, fellowship with uh, fellow believers, and, you know, it's just a wonderful day. And so, I just want to praise God for the Sabbath day. I want to praise God for how He has led through another week. And friends, if you are happy on this Sabbath day, why don't you share your praises with us? Go ahead and please let us know what you are thankful for. Let us know how God has been good to you. And please just share with us because it is an encouragement to us as well. And so friends, I am glad that I can share with you once more from God's Word. I know that we don't have um, a, a lot more time. You know, we're stopping the online sermons, but we will still, you know, uh, the, the, we will still try to produce content. And, you know, I know Pastor Ben is working on um, new things uh, and I know that it will still be a blessing. But friends, I am thankful that we can spend time together in God's Word this morning. And so the title of my sermon this morning is Whatever It Takes. Whatever It Takes. Well, before we go into the message, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the Sabbath day. Thank you so much, Lord, for your blessing, your mercy, your love in our lives. Thank you for this opportunity that we can study your word, that we can spend time with you, that we can sit at the feet of Jesus. And we're asking, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. We're asking that you would illumine our minds. We're asking that you would draw close to us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. May he be our teacher and our guide. May he be the one to convict us. May you bless us in this time. May you allow us, Lord, to be connected with you. Thank you so much for hearing and answering our prayers. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And friends, as I mentioned, the title of my sermon this morning is Whatever It Takes. Whatever It Takes. And really this morning, I want to share with you what our commitment should be. You know, in this Christian life, as we strive for salvation, as we strive you know, to gain heaven. What is our commitment? What should we do? What is God expecting from us? Well, let's begin in our first verse um, in Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. Notice what the Bible says. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Now, the Bible promises us that when we seek for God with all our hearts, we will find him. We will find Him when we search for Him with all our hearts, all our minds, when you put in effort. And you see, friends, anything in life can be done well if there's effort. Anything in life can be achieved if you put your all into it. And this applies to anything, right? It applies to your studies, applies to your work, applies to your job, applies to your health. It applies to everything in life. If you want to achieve something, you want to do well in something, then you must you must put your all into it. You must put effort. You must be willing to do whatever it takes so that you can achieve that one thing. And friends, this is the same for our spiritual life. You know, Christ is helping us to understand that if we want to seek Him, we want to find Him, we must search for Him with all our hearts. There must be effort. We must be willing to put, put our everything into it. And the promise is that when we seek God with all our hearts, when we put all our effort and energy into it, <clears throat> we will find God. We will find Him. We will find Him when we search for Him with all our hearts. Well, I want to share with you two parables. Two parables to talk about this point even more. Let's go to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 13, 13 verses 44 and 46. I want you to notice what the Bible says. It says here, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in the field, the which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchantman 
seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, <clears throat> went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now here in Matthew chapter 13, we find really two parables that we, and we are going to look at each one and we're going to see what lessons we can learn. But before we do so, what is one similarity that we find in both parables? You see, in both parables, there is a character, there is this man that when he found the treasure, when he found the pearl, what did he do? He went and sold everything. And he, he went and sold everything just so that he could gain the treasure, just so that he could gain that pearl. And friends, this shows us that there was commitment. There was effort. There was sacrifice. This man put his all into it just so that he could gain that one thing, the treasure, the pearl. But now let's look at the first parable first. Let's go back to that verse, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44. Notice what the Bible says. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Now here in this parable, it tells us that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure that is hidden in the field. While the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is this treasure? What does this treasure represent? Well, we know that this treasure is hidden, right? It's not like it's laying there. It was hidden in the ground. It was hidden in the field. Well, what does the Bible tell us about hidden treasure? Notice Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, That your hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now from these verses, we understand that hidden treasures are equated to what? Wisdom and knowledge. Two things. Hidden treasure is wisdom and also knowledge. And where is it hid? If you notice that in verse 2, let's go back there. In verse 2, it says, and of Christ, at the end of verse 2, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So where can we find hidden treasure? Where can we find wisdom and knowledge? It is hidden in Christ. It is, it is hidden in Jesus Christ. Well, what else is wisdom and knowledge compared to? Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> Notice what the Bible says. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense, but the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Now, what is wisdom compared to? If you notice here in, <clears throat> excuse me, if you notice here in verse 12, it says, wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. So what is wisdom compared to? <clears throat> wisdom is compared to money. And, and you see, this is the thing we must understand. You know, we live in a day and age when people are willing to do anything just so that they can gain money. You know, they put so much time, so much effort just so that they can gain money. Some work multiple jobs. Some, you know, they sleep less just so that they can gain more money, right? But when it comes to gaining wisdom, comes to gaining wisdom from God, they do so little. And friends, you see, the Bible is helping us to understand that just as we seek for money, just as we understand the importance of money, we must also understand the importance of wisdom. We must seek for wisdom. We must do all we can, put in effort so that we can acquire wisdom. But not only that, when we look at those verses in uh, Ecclesiastes <clears throat> 7, verses 11 to 12, notice there at the end of verse 12, excuse me, <clears throat> the Bible says that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. What does wisdom give? It gives life. And friends, that is what we must understand. Wisdom gives life. And so we, we, from this, we can conclude that this wisdom is not just referring to any wisdom. It's not referring to man's wisdom. Where can we find life? 
It's only from the wisdom of God. We find life in the wisdom of God's Word. And so when we come back to the parable, the treasure in the parable that was hid represents wisdom, represents knowledge. But guess what? It also represents life. And we know that the treasure is hid in who? Hidden treasure is hid in Jesus Christ. So in the parable, when it says that the treasure was hid in the field, who does that field represent? It's Jesus Christ, friends. It is Jesus Christ that has eternal life. It is, it's, you know, it is Christ in whom eternal life is hid. And the result of finding that treasure is having eternal life. Well, what does the Bible tell us about eternal life? Notice John. John chapter 17 and verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. <clears throat> you see, friends, eternal life is all about knowing Jesus Christ. When we know Christ, we will have eternal life. But here's the question. What does it mean to know Christ? How can we know Christ? Does it mean that we just know about Him? Does it mean that we just listen, uh, you know, about Him from others? What does it mean to know Christ? Well, let's look at the next verse. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, the Bible says that Adam knew his wife, and what was the result? They bore a son. She conceived and, she, and they bore a son. She bore a son, right? Cain. So what does it mean that Adam knew his wife? It's not, it's not that Adam knew who his wife was. The Bible is implying that they slept together. They had a deep connection. They had intimacy. And so when we apply that to God, what does it mean to know Christ? It means to grow in intimacy with Him. We need to know Him on a personal level. Not just on a, on a surface level. Not enough just to know about Him from others. We need to know Him for ourselves. And how can we do that? It is when we spend time in His Word. It is when we listen to His voice speaking to us. It is when we commune with Him daily in the study of His Word and also prayer. You see, friends, it is not enough just to know Jesus on the surface level. We must know Him personally. We must have that deep relationship with Him. We must truly know Him for ourselves. But let's go back to the parable and let's look at other details. Matthew 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Now, the Bible, the Bible tells us here that when the man finds the treasure, he hides it. Now, why does he hide the treasure? Because remember, the treasure is hid in the field, and the field does not belong to this man. And so what did he decide to do? He decided, if I want the treasure, I must buy the field. I buy the field, whatever is in the field is mine. Therefore, the treasure will be mine as well. But how is it possible? How could he buy the field? Well, he had to sell everything. He had to sell all that he had. But just imagine this with me. As this man is selling everything that he has to buy the field, what would his neighbors and friends think? You know, just imagine, you know, he's selling his house, selling his possessions, right? Uh, you know, I'll give you a good price, just, just buy from me, I'm trying to sell all that I have. His neighbors and his friends that know him, as they see him selling these things, they, will, they would come and ask, oh, why are you selling all your things for? He would answer, right? Oh, I want to buy that field. I'm selling all my things so that I can buy that field. And just imagine as his friends and neighbors look, as they look at that field and they see that it's empty. They see that there's nothing, right? They don't understand that the treasure is there, it's hid there. They don't know about that, but they see that empty field and they think, you're selling all that you have, everything that you've worked so hard for to buy that empty field that has nothing. What would they think? They would think that this man is crazy. They would think that this man is insane. But why? It's because they don't understand. They don't see the treasure 
they don't know that hidden in that field is the treasure. Friends, when you begin to sacrifice for God, when you begin to sell all that you have for God, do you think people will think you are fanatical? How about Noah? Did people think he was fanatical? 120 years preaching about rain that they had never seen and also building the ark? Yeah, they thought he was crazy. He, they thought he was insane. And the thing is, it's the same for us. If we really lived the Christian life, if we really lived according to the way God wants us to live, people will think that we're odd. People will look at you like you're weird. People will think that you're strange. They will think you're crazy. But the only reason why they think that way is because they do not understand. They do not understand that you are trying to gain a greater treasure. They do not understand the value of the treasure that you are about to get. And so when they see that you are losing things in this life, they, they cannot comprehend it. They do not understand. You know, when we, look, when we think about this parable, right? this man sold everything he had to get that treasure. What was the value of the treasure in comparison to what he owned? It was so much greater so much greater. And that's why this man realized, if I wanted to, to get that, I have to sell all that I have. He realized its worth. He realized that he was getting something so much more valuable and what he was getting worth so much more than all the things he had. And that's why he sold everything. And he was so joyful about it. And see friends, here's what we must understand. When we give up for God, God will give us so much more. He will give us so much more than what we are giving up for Him. And so when you sacrifice for God, right, when you sell your things to God, you think that you are, you are at a loss. You think you're losing, right? You think, oh, I'm losing all these things, all my hard work, all my heart and possessions. But you don't understand that God wants to give you so much more. God can, re you know, repay all that you have a hundredfold. He can give you so much more, friends. But He can give you that one thing that is so valuable. That one thing that even all the things in this world cannot compare to. And that is eternal life. That is salvation. It is heaven. And so if you really think about it, we do not lose. We only gain all the sacrifices that we make in this life will only result in us getting so much more. Now, when we look again at the parable, after the man sold everything, it says he bought the field. Notice that the Bible doesn't say that he bought the treasure. In verse 44, he buyeth that field. And that is important to understand. You see, why is it that he didn't buy the treasure? The treasure represents eternal life. And there is no way that that man could have bought eternal life. There is no one in, uh, living in this world right now that can buy, that can earn eternal life. Not with money, not with good works, not with possessions, right? There is no one that can buy eternal life. You cannot work your way to heaven. There is no such thing as salvation by works. But when we surrender everything, we can buy the field. And that field is Jesus Christ. But what does it mean to buy? It means to trade. We trade our life for His. My sin for His righteousness. His life for mine. And when we have Christ, we have life eternal. The Bible says that He ha that hath the Son hath life. And so friends, you can never buy <clears throat> eternal life. You can never buy salvation, but you can have Jesus. And if you have Jesus, then you have eternal life. But how much does Jesus cost? How much did the field cost? It cost the man everything. It took all that he had. He had to sell everything that he had just so that he could buy that field. And we must realize that salvation costs us everything. Gaining Jesus will cost us everything. What does everything include? Everything includes my ambitions. 
the way I spend my money, my career, my studies, my possessions, the way I live my life. It includes every single thing, every single aspect of your life. And you see, friends, we must be willing to sell all that we have so that we can gain Christ, so that we can gain heaven. Let me show you an example of a person in the Bible who was not willing to sell all that he had. Let's go to Matthew 19. <clears throat> Matthew 19, verses 16 to 22. <clears throat> Notice what the Bible says. And behold, <clears throat> one came to him, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, which Jesus said, Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept for my youth up, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go, and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see, this man, this rich young ruler, he was looking for the same treasure. He came to Jesus, asking Jesus, how can I have eternal life? He wanted eternal life. He loved Jesus, right? He said, all these things have I kept from my youth up. He was a good man, and he wanted eternal life. But what did Jesus tell the man? Jesus told him, If thou wilt be perfect, and by Jesus saying that, friends, it's important for us to know that we can be perfect. We can be perfect in this world. We can achieve perfection. But Jesus said, If thou wilt be perfect, sell all that you have. Give to the poor, and come and follow me. But how did the young man respond? How did the young man respond to this request? The Bible says that the young man left sorrowful. Now, why do you think he left sorrowful? It's because while this, while this young man wanted eternal life, he also wanted the world. He knew that deep down inside, as long as he held on, held on to those things, the things of the world, his riches and possessions, he could never have eternal life. And as he compared, as he weighed, he, he realized that I'm not willing. I'm not willing to give up my riches, my possessions, all that I have. I'm not willing. And you see, friends, whenever we cherish sin, whenever we cherish the, thing, the things of this world, <coughs> we also know that we don't have eternal life. And many times, many people walk away sorrowful. But notice what else Jesus said. Matthew 19, 23 and 24. <clears throat> then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So Jesus says that it's so difficult for a rich man to enter into the king kingdom of heaven. But why does he say that? It's because many wealthy people want to take their possessions with them to heaven. They are not willing to let go of their possessions so that they can gain heaven. And notice what Jesus said. Jesus said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich man to go to heaven. Now, do you know why Jesus used that illustration? Do you know what the eye of a needle is? Yes, you may think that it's the actual eye of a needle, but the eye of a needle is actually believed to be this gate in Jerusalem. It's this passageway for travelers to pass through. And if you are traveling on a camel, you know, the only way for the camel to go through the eye of a needle is for the passenger or the rider to remove all, everything from the back of the camel. Otherwise, the camel will not be able to go through. The, 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 the uh, person riding the camel has to remove everything. All the bags, whatever the camel is carrying, has to remove everything so that the camel 
can pass through. And Jesus is saying that it's easier for the camel to be rid of all the things on its back and go through the eye of a needle than for the rich man to enter into heaven. And so friends, it is the same for us. We must be willing to lose everything just so that we can gain heaven. But remember, we are not really losing. We are gaining so much more. But why do we find it so hard? Why do we find it so hard to give up? Notice the next verse. Hebrews 11, 24 and 25, the Bible says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now this is talking about Joseph, uh, Moses. And the Bible says that Moses, he chose to suffer affliction than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. You see, friends, the, the problem is many of us love sin. Many of us, we love the pleasures of sin. And that is why we find it so hard to let go of the pleasures of this world. We find it so hard to sell all that we have and to follow Jesus. But we must understand that today we must be willing to do all we can so that we can secure salvation, we can secure eternal life, and so that we can make it to heaven. Friends, we must come to this point where we will say, whatever it takes, I don't care, I'll do whatever it takes so that I can be saved, so that I can have Jesus, so that I can have eternal life. Is that something that you want to commit to, friends? Is that something that you are willing to say, whatever it takes, I will do whatever it takes to gain salvation? Well, let's look at the second parable and let's see what lessons we can learn. Matthew chapter 13, 45 and 46. Notice this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one great one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, in Jesus' day, pearls were the most valuable items or one of the most valuable items that a person could own. And what do the pearls represent in this parable? They represent what is most valuable to you. And I want you to think about that. What is most valuable to you right now? What is your most valuable possession? What is it? That is what that pearl represents. But notice that in this parable, the merchant man was seeking. He was seeking for goodly pearls. And you must understand that this is a merchant man, meaning he buys and sells pearls. Okay, he has pearls, he sells pearls, but when he also sees good pearls, he buys them. But notice, this man had to give up everything. When he found that pearl of great price, he had to sell all his pearls just so that he could get that one pearl, that pearl, pearl of great price. And friends, what does the pearl of great price represent? Who is this pearl of great price? It is none other than Jesus. You know, there is no one no one else that is the definition of perfection than Jesus. Jesus is the pearl of great price. And, and in order for us to receive Jesus, we must be willing to give up those things which are most valuable to us, those things which are more pre most precious to us. Because just like the treasure, the pearl of great price costs us everything. It costs us everything, friends. And so we must be willing to give up those things which are most valuable to us. Whether it's your, your car or your house or, you know, your, your possessions, whatever it is in your life that is most valuable to you, your degree, you must be willing to give it up. Be willing to sell it all so that you can have the pearl of great price. But you know, when we look at this parable from a different angle, we also see that Jesus is this merchant man. That Jesus is this merchant man who is looking for the pearl of great price. 
Well, what else is that pearl of great price? Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4. The Bible says this, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. What is of great price to God? The Bible says there, it is of a meek and quiet spirit. In other words, Jesus is looking for us to perfect our characters. Jesus is looking for those who have learned to reproduce the character of God in their lives. Jesus is looking for those who are reflecting His glory from day to day. He's looking for the pearl of great price, for those who have been, re, you know, revived and transformed into His image. And in order for that to happen, Jesus came and died for us. You know, Jesus had to sell everything He had so that He could gain us. Jesus sold all that He had so that He could purchase us left his home in heaven, came to the sin-dark world, lived as a man, right? Took on our sinful nature, lived a difficult life, went through mocking, went through a lot of opposition, a lot of persecution, eventually died, betrayed, denied. He went through all those things so that he could purchase you. He gave up everything, friends, so that he could gain us, so that he could save us from sin. And so Jesus is that merchant man. Jesus sold all that he had so that he could gain us. Jesus gave up everything for you and for me. The question we need to be asking ourselves is this. Are we willing to give up everything for him? And friends, that's a question that only we can answer. But we must realize today the infinite sacrifice, the infinite cost that Jesus took to save you and I. And how will we respond? How will we respond to that love? Well, I want to share with you um, this passage from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 14, 26 to 33. The Bible says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. See, friends, the Bible is clear. If we are not willing to forsake all that we have, we cannot be God's disciples. But we must also count the cost of following Jesus. You know, there are many people, many people today that they decide to follow Jesus and they don't count the cost they do not count the cost. And as they follow Jesus, they realize that, you know, they have to give up things, they have to sacrifice things. They realize that it's too pricey. It's too much. I'm not willing. And what do they do? They stop following Him. They stop. They realize it's too much. And so if we want to follow Jesus, we must follow Him all the way. But we must count the cost. But here's the thing. As you count the cost, you will realize that when we follow Jesus, you have everything. When you come to cause and when, when you compare what you're losing to what you're gaining, you will come to this conclusion that what I'm gaining is so much more. And just like the man in both the parables, you will sell everything you have with joy so that you can follow Jesus. We will realize that what we are getting in return is so much more valuable than what we lose. 
And so friends, my question for you is this. Are you willing to do whatever it takes just so that you can secure Jesus in your life? Are you willing to sell all that you have so that you can gain Jesus? Are you willing to give up anything and everything so that you can gain a place in heaven? Friends, what is God calling you to do today? And what is your response to Him? I pray and hope that as you have listened to this message, you understand the commitment that God requires. You understand the sacrifice. You understand the cost. You understand your duty. But more than that, you understand the value of the treasure. And I pray and I hope that you will do whatever it takes, that you will be willing to do anything just so that you can secure the treasure. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. And Jesus is looking for more and more committed people. People that will be willing to do whatever it takes to secure Him. To secure a place in heaven. To gain eternal life. And I pray and I hope that you and I are one of these people. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the reminder that if we search, if we want to find you, we must search for you with all our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that when we put all our efforts into seeking you, we will find you. And Lord, I thank you for helping us to understand the cost of following you. Thank you for helping us to understand the sacrifice that must take place. But Lord, it's difficult. Many of us are unwilling. Many of us, we still love sin and we still cherish sin. But help us today to be willing to give it all up for you. Help us, help us, Lord, to be willing to forsake all. Help us to be willing to sell all that we have so that we can follow you. Help us to come to cost. And as we do so, remind us of, of the value of the treasure that we are getting. And may we follow you with full joy, knowing that we are getting something so much more valuable. And so, Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to continue to look to you to put you first in our lives as we wait for the coming of Jesus. Thank you so much for hearing and answering our prayers. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you will have a blessed rest of the Sabbath day and continue to enjoy our fellowship with one another, continue to experience God's goodness in your life. And may you have also a blessed new week ahead. So take care, friends. God bless each and every one of you. Happy Sabbath.